Welcome back to the Bedtime with Cousin Vinny series, here exclusively on YouTube. I'm a critically acclaimed national author, Cousin Vinny Agnello, and this is my um, very, very popular book, The Devil's Glove, in the second edition. And we're reading about 180 pages of it in one of the world's great big teases, basically to entice you to purchase the book. Um, and uh, I, would, uh, I will be able to get you a uh, discounted version, personalized, signed, and autographed, and everything for a very economical price. You see my phone number above me to the, over here on my left, and my email address, as far as details are concerned, is CousinVinny10 at gmail.com. And, of course, you know, I don't normally dress up as uh, the protagonist of The Devil's Glove, Billy Green. But tonight I did, and because this scene is all about Billy and Eddie. And uh, this, uh, I think it's called A Rebellion in Heaven, and it's on page... 129 that I left you on. And of course, that's the devil's glove, at least symbolically. And let's get to our book. This, tonight's 15 minute segment. Page 129. Eventually, Eddie passed out and found himself wandering down the baseline toward the young infielder who was nervously biting his nails by the dugout. He was dressed as he always was in his old-fashioned Chicago White Sox uniform with those unique green patent leather baseball cleats. Eddie, my boy, it's so good to see you. You, you had me a little worried, kid, for a while there. I, I didn't think you were going to show up tonight, the dream coach said, with what seemed like the weight of the world lifted off his shoulders. He joyously ran up the baseline to greet his charge with a big hug. I'd have been here a lot earlier, but I just couldn't fall asleep. Yeah, I know about restless nights, Eddie. When I used to play, I, I could hardly sleep a wink. The man in black started to stir in the dugout, and the dream coach immediately became aware of his presence. Coach, tell me about when you used to play. The man in black stepped out of the dugout and stared evilly over at the two. The coach turned away from Eddie and, using his hands, made a, uh, a gesture for the dark man to relax. Eddie, I'm not allowed to talk about my life, so please don't ask me about it. it let's just concentrate on yours instead. I've been told that you're having problems with some of the older boys at school. You have to do something about these problems, Eddie. If you don't, the manager says you won't be allowed to come here and visit me anymore. That's exactly one of the reasons I couldn't sleep, coach. It's not like it was back in middle school. I'm not big enough to beat up everybody who messes with my glove these days. In fact, I think a lot of my troubles have come about because the word got out about my middle school reputation. Now I find myself having to deal with the older brothers of all the kids I beat up back then, and believe me, they haven't been very kind about it, Eddie said dejectedly. The dream coach picked up a baseball that was lying on the pitcher's mound and began throwing the ball up in the air and catching it while continuing his conversation with Eddie. Nervously, he said in a staged and rehearsed manner, Eddie, um, I told you that sacrifices have to be made in order to uphold the integrity of the glove. No one uh, ever told you that making sacrifices was going to be easy. You don't get anything in this world for free. You know that, and, and I certainly do. So, so far, the sacrifices you've made have been relatively small ones. Beating up the kids who touch your glove wishing your teammates bad luck during ball games. These are insignificant sacrifices. And may I add, small prices for you to pay for the kind of talent and instructions you've received since you've arrived here. You know, sometimes I don't believe that you believe a word that you say. Look at you. 
You're busy concentrating on catching that ball instead of looking over at me. Is that because you don't want to look at me? Or maybe it's because you're making light of my problems. Because to be honest with you, coach, those have been very significant sacrifices. Those very sacrifices that you say are so insignificant are the ones that are causing me the most grief in school. Coach, nobody even likes me anymore. Everybody wants to mess with me. I've been singled out as a target for abuse. And he pleaded in exasperation. The coach suddenly dropped the ball. I understand, Eddie. Believe me, I understand. The coach divulged with heartfelt sympathy, displaying the fact that his sense of humanity was still intact. The dark man ran toward the gathering and pulled the coach over to the side. Immediately, Eddie heard the thundering sounds of a tornado that totally drowned out his ability to pick up on their conversation. It bottled his mind that there was no wind. He could hear the tornado, but he could not feel or see it. What he did see was the manager screaming at his coach, and he wished more than anything that he could suddenly become a lip reader. Unfortunately, this was a gift that Eddie never acquired. If you don't stop, with that bleeding heart bullshit, you're going to find yourself teaching baseball with the others. And believe me, you won't like it there. There won't be any grass or any cool breeze. Do you understand me? You better get it through that thick, lame brain of yours that your job is not to show compassion for that boy, but to show him the way to me. I've invested a lot of time in this boy, and I will not take kindly to any reversals of fortune. The boy's inner drive for greatness is starting to weaken. It's obviously obvious that we're losing our grip on him. He's starting to worry about what people think of him. Just the tone of his voice tells me that he's starting to second-guess my ploy. And we must get those thoughts extinguished immediately. We must steer him back into conformity. We must put him on the Procrustean bed. You tell him that I want those boys that play keep away with his glove severely beaten. Or he can forget all about any professional baseball aspirations. This way he'll have to prove his allegiance toward us. You teach him how to beat those boys up. Well, your services here will no longer be necessary. The dark man raved and threatened. Do you understand me? Yes, the coach said sullenly with his head bowed. Good! Now go get to it! The dark man snapped his fingers and then walked slowly back toward the dugout and the tornado sound was instantly relieved from Eddie's ears. What in hell was that all about? I saw him chewing you out something fierce, but I couldn't hear a damn thing. You know, I'm starting to dislike that guy. The manager's angry, Eddie. He says he's going to take away the magic in the glove if, if you don't get even with those boys that terrorize you. The manager says no one is to touch your glove but you. Easier said than done. Did you tell them how big the kids are now? Did you tell them that they have no reservations about ganging up on me? Eddie stated these facts sounding completely overwhelmed by his new problem. Eddie, there's a way around them ganging up on you. Most important thing is mindset. To beat a bully, you have to think like one. One thing you have to remember about bullies is, they, is that they like to give a whole, lot, a whole hell of a lot more than receive. Bullies have a notorious reputation of being afraid to receive the medicine they dish out to others. Every bully I ever ran into hated to get hit. They didn't mind doing the hitting, but they usually chickened out when faced with some legitimate opposition 
And to a bully, legitimate opposition is anyone who doesn't lie down and take it. They enjoy beating up on pacifists or people who are just too afraid to defend themselves. Now, Eddie, I don't think that you fit into either one of those categories. So here is a few tips to ponder, kid. Number one, since they're bigger than you are, you need to cut them down to your own size. Number two, you need to catch them individually so that you won't have to deal with them as a group. And lastly, you have to appear to be so crazy in their eyes that the thought of retaliation will never cross their minds. How am I going to do all that? Don't forget I want to play on the same team with these kids. Intimidation, Eddie. That's how the game is played. That's how the mafia works. That's how bullies are successful. That's how the world works, Eddie. All the world's strongest leaders are friends with the manager and have adopted his policy that it's better to be feared than loved. You can persuade those boys that it's in their best interest to shut their mouths. Intimidation, Eddie. It really works. The coach recited these thoughts like a bad actor who indicates his feelings. He just wasn't very convincing, and anyone perceptive would know immediately that these thoughts were scripted and not his own. He added, don't fret, Eddie. Before you awaken, you shall know what to do. And he stared over at him curiously, thinking that something was definitely wrong, but kept it to himself and replied facetiously, that's what I like about hanging out with you guys. You never leave anything up to chance. Whenever I leave, leave here, I always feel like I have an edge on everybody else. That edge you're talking about, Eddie, that's exactly why I'm here, the coach stated with underlying emphasis while deliberately looking the boy straight in the eyes. As soon as those words were uttered, the dark man, the manager of this little fantasy world, raced out of the dugout and confronted the coach. With fire in his eyes, he shouted, I detect a betrayal. What are you trying to say to the boy? The coach stood shaken nervously, trying desperately to regain his composure. There's no betrayal here, boss. I'm, I'm not a traitor to the team. What I meant by what I said was uh, that I was here to give him the edge. I swear that's what I meant, the coach pleaded. The manager stared deeply into the coach's eyes, and he knew that trouble was brewing on the horizon. The coach was slowly but surely beginning to despise him, and the telltale signs of this were written all over his face. But due to the coach's unique relationship with the boy, there was not much he could do without jeopardizing the overall scheme of things. So for the time being, he tried his best to ignore the rebellion and begrudgingly started the long trek back to the dugout. As a result, Eddie took mental note of this incident. Little did he know it at the time, but this memory, among many others, would be of the utmost significance to him in his future attempts to unravel the enigma that had become his life. Talking about intimidating. Boy, he has a short fuse, huh? Glad I don't have to deal with no managers like him. Don't you feel like punching him right in the snot box sometimes? Eddie asked showing his coach a clenched fist. Eddie, don't, those, don't say those kind of things here, please. You don't strike the manager. Remember that, kid, because no matter how good you are, he still calls the shots. The coach sighed while intently watching the dark man go back into the dugout. Okay, we won't talk about that overbearing pain in the ass anymore. We'll just talk about baseball. 
Do you know I overheard Sandy Roberts talking today about how his fastball was clocked at over 90 miles per hour? That's awfully fast for high school. I bet you're afraid that you can't stand in against pitching that fast, the coach asked with concern. Well, let's put it this way. I've never seen pitching even close to that speed. I mean, this guy's got a major league fastball. Eddie, the secret to hitting that kind of fastball is increasing your bat speed. In the old days, guys used to think that the bigger and heavier the stick, the more power they got. But that simply isn't the case. It's bat speed, Eddie. The faster you can move a bat through the strike zone, the more power you'll have. So what I'm trying to say is to forget about that heavy...